Mythology with me, Kelm Leslie. Yes, it is me. I'm sorry. And Sossel here for a Clash of the Titans. EU versus NA. We know what team we're on, but uh, some of you might be on it. <laughs> it is Orange versus Strife Crow. Orange looking to repeat the success of his Archon team. It's Zalei. Zalei just took down Dog 3-2 to two, if you missed it. And we, of course, have Orange versus Strife coming up now. This is a super intriguing matchup. We talked about this earlier. Orange was one of the breakthrough players of 2015. One of only three players to ever win. One of only two players, in fact, sorry, to ever win a major, two majors. Uh, it's only him and Kalenta who have ever won two tournaments of $20,000 or more, which is a pretty impressive record. Uh, Strife Crow won one of the very first major tournaments, which was the, the Seat Story Cup. Mm -hmm. And, of course, went to the World Championships in 2014. Was on ESGN's Fight Night. He's been around yeah. forever. Oh, literally the entire length of competitive Hearthstone, Strife Crow has been around, but hasn't necessarily made the, the biggest impact in recent years. Right, that was the, the point I wanted to make. You know, Strife Crow is, is definitely part of the, the old guard at this point, and he was he was kind of a legendary name early on, even though pe even before people really got to see him play, there was this these whispers running around the Hearthstone community of, oh, this guy Strife Crow is insane, he's one of the best players for sure. Um, and then we, we finally sort of got to see him play, and he backed that up pretty consistently for a year, but... Um, recently, you know, his tournament results haven't really backed up that point, so he needs to really get back on the horse here and pick up some tournament wins, and what better place to start than right here? Absolutely. Just as an aside, so talking about the early days of competitive Hearth, so do you know who won the first recorded Hearthstone competitive tournament? The first tournament ever recorded on Gosu Gamers for Hearthstone? I do not, Callum. Enlighten me. It was Chan Man. Wow. <laughs> won a, I think it was a Liquid Open tournament. Nice. Uh, with people like Koyuki playing in that and some of the very early guys of Hearthstone. I've been going back and watching ESGN recently because I'm doing a, I'm writing a piece about it. Okay. So I got to watch a lot of the old ESGN stuff and it's it's quite entertaining. It was a, ESGN is what really got me into into esports and competitive Hearthstone. I just found ESGN somehow and uh, yeah, and it was it was really entertaining. All right, guys, everyone out there, you now know who to blame. ESGN exactly. is to blame for Callum Leslie's presence right now. Uh, but let's look at the lineups here. Orange has brought Paladin, Warrior, Mage, and Rogue. So the Hunter has been abandoned. We've seen this, I believe, in his, his last tournament appearance. Can't quite remember what it was, but it, he's moved away from that hybrid Hunter a little bit recently. Maybe his, uh, his new training camp with the, the SK guys has yeah. uh, convinced him that that is not the right pick anymore. Um, so yeah, Paladin, Mage, Rogue, and wait, yeah, Paladin, Mage, Rogue, and Warrior from Orange, Druid, Paladin, Warlock, and Warrior from Strife Crow. We can see that Strife Crow's Warrior is banned, and Orange's Mage is banned. Yeah, so that leaves us with Paladin, Warrior, Rogue, and Druid, Paladin, Warlock. Interesting. So we're doing, we do see double Paladin once again. Uh, we saw that in our, not our last match, but the match before that, the Rise and Show match as well, and another Rogue. This is really interesting. We're seeing quite a lot of Rogue today. Um, but Orange is another player who does has played a lot of Rogue in the past. Um, and it does feel like it's 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 players we like Rogue are bringing Rogue. Yeah. And players we don't really care about Rogue that much are just avoiding it. Right. And it is, it's one of those decks that you you really get to, to stamp your, your influence on. I talked about it before, but it's such a, a difficult to play deck. And it's a deck with such a variance of decisions that you feel like when you're a strong rogue player, it's a it's a wise idea to bring it to the tournament because you actually open up this route to really outplay your opponent, which is something that's more difficult to do with, say, you know, Druid, Paladin, etc. Like, I these decks, fight. sure, you can criticize them for maybe allowing weaker players to win, but they also allow strong players to lose in a weird way because... <laughs> They, there's not that much room with the deck to stamp the fact that you're a better player because there's very, very little room to fit you in between the skill floor and the skill ceiling. I just, I, you might say that it allows worse players to win. You might say that. You might. I don't, I don't know. I don't know who Do would you? say that. Who would say that? I don't so know, Callum. I don't know. Do you want to go on the record as to saying that? <laughs> I mean, you're you're the expert player here, not me. All right. I I am one of those terrible players that Secret Paladin likes to win. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Fair enough. Anyway, we have got into match one here, and it is in fact a Paladin from Orange. I didn't see the Mulligan, so no chance to to catch if we saw any secrets in the in the opening ha in the opening Mulligan. But no secrets in hand yet. But it looks like the Secret Paladin build could also alternatively be the 
quote-unquote zoo-style paladin that Game King popularized and a few people have picked up and brought to tournament, um, but would suspect that it's just secret paladin at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, that sort of aggro paladin is uh, its actually quite effective against secret paladin, so some people have been trying to play it. I see Game King played it in some recent tournaments, but yeah, I'd expect this to be secret paladin. And the double two drops is, are always good. Yeah, Wrath is expended there from Strife Crow, and the Knife Juggler immediately follows up. But he did pick up the Shade of Nax Ramus that he can now play out on curve if he'd like to. But there is the danger of the Muster for Battle now coming down in the immediate swipe. But this is pretty much the dream opening here from Orange. Turn one, mini bot. Turn two, Juggler. Turn three, Muster. First knife misses. Second oh, hits. Well, on this one. No, I doesn't get it. All right. We were talking earlier about things that are disgusting about uh, Secret Paladin. I, I, I thought of another one watching Strife Crow take the Divine Shield off the minibot, mm -hmm. which is turn two minibot, your opponent pings off the shield, and then you cock hammer. That's also disgusting. Yeah, that is always pretty tilting when that happens. <laughs> um, but yeah, it looks like Swipe is the play here, and he'll probably choose to keep his shade stealthed here. No real value in trading it into what's effectively a 2-1 after the Swipe. Um, but Orange is curving out almost perfectly here. There is one gap in this perfect curve, Callum. Just the one. <laughs> yeah. And where and where is he? Well, I don't think it's any of your business, so, so I know exactly where he is. It's two cards from the top of the deck right now. That's where it is. Well, an Innervate Ancient of Lore is pretty good, and that does give Strife Crow a lot of answers. You know, he has the combo, has a second force of nature, in fact. Mm. Living Roots, Lotheb. Lots of resources, but... Uh, yeah, that curve that Orange is about to hit, as you say, has two draws to hit that Mysterious Challenger. Lotheb, easy to come down this turn. Or is it? Do you, do you then double trade into the 5-5 five five or just leave it? Um, I mean, you've got your opponent all the way down to 17 already, so pushing another 5 this turn looks appealing. Uh, you're locking out most of the flexible options due to playing Lotheb, so it feels like that the the five fives will just end up trading on the board anyway um so yeah i kind of feel like just faces the place here just get your six damage in with the minions and the weapon slam down lotheb and uh like i said that mysterious challenger is two cards off the top of the deck so it's now the next card pretty much a 172 percent chance that it's drawn next turn 172 percent yeah that's that's how maths works okay well we'll, we'll put this to the i mean you're the expert here <laughs> we'll put this to the test of, uh, of 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 where this mysterious challenger is, if it's the next card in the deck, yeah, we're gonna find out. Well, there's a counter Lothab option for Strife Crow, and it's pretty much the only option other than a six mana Living Roots, I think. Right, but this is the situation. The counter Lothab comes down. Like I said, the five fives do have to trade, so definitely gets rewarded. Ah, well, that's a, that's a it's a six drop. It's a fraction. It's a fraction of the mysterious challenger. It's uh, 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 all right. Never mind. I was wrong. Okay, fine. I'll say it. It happens, okay. It's a six drop and it's secret related. You're like one of, you're like one of those those uh, mediums will tell you something and be like, oh, well, that's kind of what I meant. It's kind yeah. of the same. You just make everything as ambiguous as possible. I just committed a little bit too hard. I should have said he's going to draw something six mana and secret related and then obviously covering my outs. But more importantly, there is just a crap ton of pressure on the board right now. Druid all the way down to six HP. <laughs> This is the thing, isn't it? And this is why Secret Paladin, as we were talking, it's all about the curve, really, in a lot of senses. No Mysterious Challenger played, not even had the boom and the Tyrion come down, but the Druid is at 6 health. Yeah. Problem is, there is a lot of removal in the hand right now, and if against this deck you can just continue clearing all their minions each turn, they don't really play damage from hand. Like, True Silver is the biggest expected level of damage from hand, and they don't even always play that. Um, so sometimes you can just get away with it, even hovering at really low health totals. The problem is he's going to have to have really, really good answers to these two follow-up plays. But the good news from his perspective is he does have the first of those two necessary answers, which is the, the big game hunter for the Doctor Doom. Alright, so yeah, as you say, the board pretty much cleared up, but there comes Doctor Boom to refill the board pretty effectively with those little 1-1 boom bots. And the 7-7, seven, seven. and there is, again, there's a big game Hunter, and uh, can't quite force of nature to clear up the board, but can use the hero power and the Lotheb. But this is looking pretty dire for Strife Crow early here. 
It is. Um, like I said, there is, there is a small window of opportunity for him to fight his way back into this game. He does have the big game hunter here for the Doctor Boom, but the Tyrion is going to come down immediately afterwards. And just being able to clear that Tyrion is not going to be good enough. He's going to need to get that Keeper of the Grove, because the damage from the Ashbringer right now is just too much to deal with. I mean, you're at 6 health. You yeah. can't really afford to give him the Ashbringer. Exactly. If you give your opponent the Ashbringer, you're on a 15 health clock. Yeah. And uh, that's not the kind of clock Strife Crew can really afford to be on right now. Um, for, I mean, from uh, Strife Pro's perspective, he's probably feeling the, the possibility of a counter swing here with Force of Nature Savage Roar, but the Tyrion is going to come down and wall some of that out. But if these boom bots don't do enough work here, is there still potential of lethal? I don't think so. He won't be able to use his face to hit the Divine Shield. That's a key factor. He definitely won't be able to use his face anymore. Uh, boom, second Boombot can still go face for three. I think you should probably check that before you play Tyrion. Unless you don't intend to trade this Boombot into something. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can win with the Boombot, right? Right. So I <laughs> feel like trading the Boombot is right before playing Tyrion, but Orange disagrees, which means he's just going to go face with the Boombot here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So now Force of Nature, Savage Roar, three of the tree, like basically the entire tree combo has to go into Tyrion to clear it. No, he can use one and he can use the Shredder and he has seven damage, uh, 11, 15. So he's one damage off. I believe he's one damage off lethal right now, if I've counted that right. Yeah. Let's just yeah. double check. He can't use his face to proc the shield. So four damage from a tree has to go in, six damage from the Shredder goes in. And then there's 7, 11, 15, 17, yeah. Feels bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is an example of almost druid things. Yeah, we, we have just druid things. This is almost druid things. Uh, a charge minion from the Shredder is lethal. Let's try, yeah, Bluegill. Oh, Bluegill Warrior would have been lethal there. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Nice of Strifecrow to spot that. I'm gonna hold my. I only spotted it because I saw Strikecrow go for the play and wondered why he was bothering. But Strikecrow identified his out there, picked up that a Bluegill Warrior would have been lethal. So, good on him for going for it. Doesn't get rewarded for noticing, but um, Orange is gonna go out to a 1 0 lead here and a nice quick game one. Absolutely. So, Strikecrow is going to have the. So, Strikecrow's me is Warrior is banned, so he's gonna have the Warlock and the Paladin left. Depends on what Warlock he's playing. Um, I'd assume the Paladin is likely a version of Secrets Paladin. It and... seems very, very likely, yeah. I mean, there's usually one in most tournaments that brings anything. You usually see it pop out of the woodwork for one game. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think the deck is quite there yet in terms of um, being refined enough to really have an impact. There's definitely the shell of a really, really powerful deck there. Um, and it can be effective on ladder for sure. But in terms of bringing it to a tournament lineup, it seems unlikely. <laughs> Yeah, well, interestingly, Strifecore not feeling too too confident in his Warlock, or he's brought something interesting in Paladin, because he's picking the Paladin here. Interesting. Wow. It's so possible. He... I mean, so we talked earlier about the Four Secrets version. Yeah. The Four Secrets version actually is really good a lot of the time against the the heavier Secrets version. Yeah, it came out, um, like it, it was hit, I believe it was Cross who hit rank one legend with it on the NA yeah. server. And the reason he did it is just because it was so effective in what was an infested Secret Paladin meta at that point. And just having those mysterious challenges and the more, so having the zombie chows and the more consistent draws of just not drawing your secrets all the time was just super powerful in the matchup. And you had Aldor as an additional answer to, you know, mysterious challenger. If it got oh, hi, it is anything. Oh, we did it. Awesome. <laughs> I love watching this deck. All right, so take us through the secret paladin versus any fin matchup. Uh, sure. Um, you play a ton of sustain in this deck, and you play a ton of board clear. Um, so while pyromancer equality, equality consecration. Basically, if you can answer a board with that once, you put yourself in a very stable position where no matter how much you've been beaten up in the early game. You can then start to get your protective cards like Sludge Belcher, Anti Killbot, etc., onto the board. And um, so it is pretty effective. I don't know how I feel about him picking it into this matchup over a unknown Warlock deck, but then obviously I don't know what his Warlock deck is, so it's hard to comment. Um, but it's definitely a winnable match. Double Bluegill Warrior in the opening hand is a solid start as well. I mean, Strafecore does know his matchups pretty well, and if you're running decks on ladder to test them, you do get a pretty good sense of how your deck runs against Secret Paladin these days. Yeah. 
and uh, you know it's possible he's tested his warlock extensively on ladder and doesn't or against secret paladins in testing and just doesn't like the matchup and likes this one better. So it'll be interesting to see what the warlock is for because the and the any fin is still definitely an unconventional pick. It is, yeah, and it's uh, it's a deck that you can kind of get some some free wins out of inexperience, but it's also a deck that you need to be able to pilot yourself effectively in order for it to be a valid bring uh, pick to the tournament. Uh, we see Orange choosing to go with the turn one redemption into mini bot line, and having now drawn four secrets in the early game, this is uh, less than ideal. Outstanding. He's he's maybe got four or five left in his deck now. Yep. And probably all single copies as well. There's because generally you only run double noble sack and double avenge. Some have run double redemption. Yeah, it's rare. Usually double avenge and double noble sack are the only double copies. And then competitive spirit is common. Redemption is common. Repentance is kind of starting to find its way out. Um, and then beyond that, you know, kind of into kind of into meme territory with the eye for the eye, eye for an eye and the sacred. You gotta love eye for an eye. Yeah. Eye for an eye. Yeah, Sacred Trial, I think, is more of a meme than Eye for, than eye for an Eye at this point. Oh, for, for sure. It's, Sacred Trial is a worse card than Eye for an Eye, for sure. No doubt in my mind. So the Competitive Spirit does go off here, which gives him five power on board. That muster is only six, which means this Tempo Doomsayer is going to stick, and Strife Crow is going to get a two-mana Solemn Vigil in his hand, which is really important here. Yeah, this I was I, I did actually get a chance to talk to Nebs, uh about this deck after watching him play it on Monday. Um, Nevs is a, a streamer who's played a lot of anything Paladin. Probably as much as anyone. Orange just shouldn't hero power here, yeah. So the, the temptation for the inexperienced here is just to press hero power, because why not? But of course, yeah. pressing hero power just um, increases the value of your opponent's uh, Solemn Vigil, or decreases the cost of your opponent's Solemn Vigil, to be clear. Yeah. But also smart play to develop a bunch of his secrets, because he knew his ha he, he uh, got a handle on his redemption ordering and knew he could get back a, a big shielded mini bot on the board here. Yeah, it's gone really well for Orange. But yeah, I got a chance to talk to Nebs in relative detail about this deck, and it is actually quite a complicated deck oh, to yeah. pilot. Yeah. Um, and it was a, a situation where Nevs had a, 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 I think it was a, it was a Thoris in the, on the, uh, his opponent's side that had two health left, and he was sitting with a Bluegill Warrior in hand and a True Silver. Now, normally you would think, you know, you want to kill the Marlocks, two health, let's use the Bluegill, but he used the True Silver mm -hmm. uh, because it was to him it was lesser value, and he then used the True, the two Bluegills at the same time to kill something with four health to decrease his Soul and Vigil. Right. And I went and asked him, but he was like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking I'll draw the second bluegill and then I'll kill something else at the same time. So that gives me a double re reduction on the Solemn Vigil. Yeah. And it, it does require that kind of forward thinking. And actually, True Silver, it's so funny to me that True Silver Champion was for a long time, I mean, in Arena it still is, but it was considered one of the best cards for Paladin. Every Paladin deck had to have two True Silvers in it, and it was such a key card. Yeah. But now a lot of Secret Paladins don't run True Silver at all. Yeah. And in the Anything, it's such a low value card. It's if any, in a lot of cases, it's just healing. Let me... Uh, I mean, yeah, there are times where uh, playing it on turn four is really effective and and gains you just enough of a tempo just to develop like Sludge Belcher afterwards if you're playing it. Use a heal bot to heal up, but. I mean, I agree. True Silver has definitely fallen off in power, as primarily as more Death Rattles have been introduced to the game. You know, Death Spite, for example, is just so much more effective against Death Rattle minions like Haunted Creeper because of the extra you know, uh, effect that you get after you've used it. True Silver sometimes is just a bit too honest in terms of interacting with a lot of the minions in the game right now. Um, oh, okay, I was right. I was right, Callum. I was right. I, I told you that Challenger was going to get drawn on turn six. I just had the wrong game. The wrong game? I yeah. mean, that's more dodgy medium stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Just exactly that. <laughs> Hearth, Hearthstone casting co done by a cold reader. That's what you're listening to right now. Um, so, yeah. Looks... Tomorrow, we'll tune back in tomorrow. We'll get we'll crack the Ouija board out. Yeah, exactly. So, Noble Sack and Avenge are going to be the secrets pulled here as the additional copies from the Mysterious Challenger. And this is just going to be so much power on board that the Equality Consecration is going to need to come down here. There it goes. So just one power remaining on board here now for Orange. Just has that uh, slime in play, but he does have some refill, and the Lotheb is pretty solid as well if he wants to go down that line. Yeah, he needed to pick up something here, I think, of at least a decent size, something like a Shredder or a Lotheb, 
Uh, Master for Batland's Secret Keeper is not the greatest value. Um, though it's not terrible against this deck. There isn't... This deck... I, I, I say I, I haven't played personally a lot of it or against it, mm -hmm. um, but it just is very weird in how it interacts with the board and how it plays minions out. Yeah. So it's it's it can be very difficult to play against if you've not played against it that much. For sure. Second second Doomsayer a little bit late for that now. The the level of power on the board is just stacking up a bit too much. So we're gonna play the Doctor Boom. Doctor Boom kind of a, a niche inclusion in this deck. It's something that's no surprise that Strike Crow is running because I believe Kalento was the first person to really popularize putting Doctor Boom in this deck. So obviously as Cloud9 teammates, that tech is probably shared between them. Kalento has probably convinced Strife Crow that it's correct. But um, I remember, I think it was Frodan uh, talked about on cast that he overheard an argument between Strife Crow, uh, between, no, between Kalento and a couple of other players about the right way to build Secret Paladin. And that's kind of where it is right now. It's in that kind of early days Grim Patron spot where everyone recognizes this strategy is powerful, but we just don't know what the final list looks like yet. We're still working towards that. Right. It's, you know, do you play Belchers in it, for example? Yeah. Do you try and add things like Ragnaros, which is something other people have added? Is there room for an Aldor Peacekeeper? All these questions. Yeah, I mean, and the the choice of early game as well. Like, do you just go for the efficient cards, like shielded mini bots, or do you want to play, you know, unstable ghouls, you know, doomsayers, all this kind of stuff? I think doomsayer becomes has become a staple now at this point, just because of how strong it is with Solemn Vigil. Um, but yeah, you know, we're getting to that point now where it, the deck is starting to stabilize, and that Murkai is going to come down now. We've seen two blue gills get played already. The Murkai is now in play, and the Anyfin is in hand. So we are threatening a grand total of eight damage for ten mana from that anything can happen right now. That's like the reverse of an old pyroblast. Oh come on, don't know somebody there. That was not bad. That was not bad. Duh, you're the worst. <laughs> you're actually the worst. That no sell though. Um so yeah, the, the I hate I hate you almost as much as Twitch chat hates me. Uh, uh, wow, that's a lot. Damn. <laughs> wow, I'm scared now. Oh, that's the second Ancient Watcher we've seen. The first one was irrelevant because it came out of the um, the shredder on the turn where Strife Crow was just checking for Bluegill Warrior lethal. Uh, yeah. But speaking of Murlocs, I love the play here to develop the War Leader alongside the Doomsayer. So Orange has to pick here. Even if he did pick up the damage to be able to deal with that Doomsayer, he, that would involve leaving that Murloc War Leader alive. Um, and that Murloc War Leader being alive is going to add six, seven more total damage. That's now 14 additional damage. Yeah, that's what's, uh, that's what's really funny in that situation is you can either have it come back from the Anything, or you can have it stay on the board and it still interacts with the Anything. Yeah, exactly. It's just catch-22. You're kind of screwed either way at that point. So. That was also the second time as well. This, uh, both Doomsayers in this game, Strife Ghost played them where Orange has been one damage off being able to kill them. The victory is yours. Wow. Victory is the Murlocs. Indeed. Anything Paladin. Uh, anything Paladin? What's a Paladin, Cameron? Why did you say that? What's wrong with you? I don't you? know, Sol. Why would you say that? I don't know. Any Finn Pally coming out with a splash here in this tournament, picking up a win. Strike Crow back in the series now, and uh, Orange is going to have to look at his lineup and find a counter for this deck, which is kind of the way it works, because the matchups for any Finn Pally are so polarized. You tend to have, like, 65 to 70% favored matchups, and then the same thing unfavored. And so does it come to, a lot of senses this comes down to how much Orange is tested with any Finn Paladin. If he knows right. the matchups and he happens to have one of the really good ones, he's in a good spot. If he doesn't and he accidentally picks a bad one and he's picked Rogue, I don't know if you can maybe enlighten us on how good that matchup is, but uh, you know, has he picked correctly? Uh, he's picked Rogue into it? Yes. Um, mm, it's time. What does he have left is my other question. He, he has... has Rogue and... What? Mage? No, he has uh, Rogan Warrior. Rogan, okay. So, yeah. Um, Rogue is a better choice than the Warrior, for sure. Any Finn Pally kind of farms all kinds of Warrior decks. It feels like Control Warrior should be able to get out of range, but they just can't. Like, it doesn't happen. The second Any Finn against, really, against a really slow Control Warrior deck is, like, 1,712 damage. It's something... you've got, yeah, exactly. The second Any Finn is the one you've got to worry about in that situation, yeah. because you've got time to kill every single yeah, one of your exactly. Murlocs. 
Um, so yeah, for sure Rogue is going to have a better chance, but with all the board clear that this deck plays, it's in a similar spot to Control Warrior, where it can just kind of eliminate the Rogue's threats one by one, stabilize with Belchers and Healbots, and then you again, you just have all the time in the world, because unlike Warrior, you, you also just kill them very rapidly from large amounts of health. All right, so we see a another Doomsayer coming to hand for Strife Crow, so we can get a Temple Doomsayer if he wants. Don't think there's going to be as many targets this time. But uh, Orange, I think, is more likely to be playing the Oil Rogue than the Miracle Rogue. Yeah, I would suspect that is the case. Um, just daggers down the 1-1. One, one. Obviously, it's just a strong interaction between the two hero powers there. Rogue comes out way ahead in that exchange, but... The early small exchanges like that are not what's going to decide this matchup. What's going to decide this matchup is whether Rogue can get enough pressure down early and whether the Paladin whiffs on the answers for that pressure. And when do you play the Murlocs as the Murloc Paladin? You know, do you just throw them out early game as early game minions, for example? Do you use them as removal? Like the, the War Leader on turn three there, for example, mm -hmm. was it an option to just play the, the War Leader as a 3-3? Three, three? It's, so it's, it's debatable, and it also depends on matchups. Um, for example, keeping a War Leader in your hand makes your Bluegill Warriors a much more effective removal spell, essentially, essentially later in the game. But there's also this perception of, like, in matchups where you're in a hurry, you tend to look at those wall, uh, those Murlocs as just units of mana in your hand that need to be invested at some point, right? Like, I need to get this Bluegill Warrior played. I need to get this Murloc War Leader played. Um, but in this kind of matchup, you probably don't feel like you're in too much of a rush. So I, I like Strike Crow's decision there just to hold on to the War Leader. Makes a lot more of, uh, lot more of his cards more effective later on in the game. Humility, a card that has been played in uh, any Finn Paladin that I don't know if it's really been played in a long 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 time right the other deck the last time was like real old school control paladin where you play yeah humility like Poker. life coach paladin yeah humility stampeding kodo and stuff like that so yeah yeah back when like yeah life coach was the the king of the control paladin even bringing like kelthazard paladin to, i think yeah kelthazard like, yeah. pilot sky golems like all kind of craziness going on in life coaches paladin decks for a while yeah, so there is the Sludge Belcher option for Strife Crow, but he's just going to go for the somewhat preemptive Doomsayer here. Hmm. And not going to kill the Unstable Go. Uh, he's already swung. He swung into the Shredder. Oh, right, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, interesting use of the Doomsayer there. It does get him that kind of time warp turn that Doomsayer is used for in pretty much every deck that isn't Freeze Mage. Um, but it doesn't allow him to have too strong of a follow-up afterwards. It does block potentially an Azure Drake turn from Orange to slow him down there. Um, there could also be a, a Coin Auctioneer turn into a million preps and things if it was a, a Miracle deck. But normally when you play the Doomsayer, you're trying to block an important turn from your opponent, or you're looking to set up either a Solemn Vigil or a strong play of your own. Um, so the, this is kind of none of those things. He does get the Belcher on an empty board, but he could have just as easily just jammed the Belcher there. Yeah, so a couple of lanes of play. He's, looks like Orange is going for the Violet Teacher into the Sap. You could also use the damage you have on board, the Dagger uh, Backstab SI7 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of options for Orange, but he's going to Sap this Doom Guard rather than kill it off altogether. Yeah, and... Uh... A little bit frustrating from Orange's perspective that that unstable goal came <laughs> yeah. out because um, it's not exactly going to help him out too much in uh, generating those 1-1s one on the board. And as long as that unstable goal stays there as well, that equality or the two equalities now that we see in Strike Crow's hand is actually a hard board clear because he can just chill and you know tank some hits for, for one turn if he wants to and then just use equality and that clears the board. But it looks like he's going to forgo the greed and just do the same thing right now. He's at least considering it. Was there any merit to Orange backstabbing the the Unstable Ghoul, trading into the 1-1 one, one before playing the Violet Teacher? Uh, you remember that conversation we had about cute plays, Callum? Yeah. <laughs> it's probably one of those. Cool. Yeah. All right, we're going gonna, gonna to try again <laughs> with this Doomsayer. So it looks like Strive Crow is, uh, is well on the, the idea of oh. wanting to get that Sludge Belcher down on an unanswered board here. Well... I mean, he could play Tinkers and kill it if he really wants. Yeah. He can also, yeah, he can backstab SI7 here. Backstab SI, which looks a lot better, yeah. Double prep in hand is a little bit clunky. It's okay if you draw sprint at some point <laughs> very soon, but other than that, it's not ideal in the coming turns. Yeah. 
So although uh, he hasn't got his his dream of the developing the Belcher on the on the free board here, he has at least got rid of that deadly poison that was threatening to remove his Belcher alongside, say, the unstable Ghoul a couple of turns ago. So now the Sludge Belcher does seem like a pretty solid play. Um, puts up a nice defensive wall here, ready for the Lay on Hands afterwards. And Lay on Hands in this deck is deceiving. Generally, in a lot of matchups, you don't care whether it heals you or not. You're just playing that thing to draw three cards. Yeah, you want to draw your cards, draw your Murlocs and your anything, of course, and set up for your combo. Fan of Knives is not a great pickup. It does allow him to sift through the deck a little bit. Yeah, it does. It's Cycles, and Cycle is something he needs right now because double Tinker's double prep is not much of a hand. He can do a ton of damage with it, but um, with all the healing that this deck is playing, you wouldn't expect that kind of line to be able to stick here, so... Uh, unless Orange is going to push all in this turn, I imagine we'll see the Fan of Knives come down. It's just, he may be considering whether or not he wants to use the prep here as well. And there's not any way to get... You can you can do a lot of damage if you were to pick up a Blade Flurry, but there's not any way to do anything close to lethal damage here. No. So chooses not to use the prep. Using the prep would have allowed him to play the Azure Drake this turn, but it looks like he's just going to go ahead and use the, tinker, use the Fan of Knives to combo the Tinker's Oil here. And uh, just be interesting to see where he directs these attacks, because he might be just deciding it's time to be aggressive. The minion goes to face, but what's he going to do with the weapon here? He's going to hold on to it. Interesting. So it looks like he wants to stack up that second charge of Tinkers before he starts attacking by the looks of things. Yeah, so I was going to say, it's uh, slightly deceptive there that I think keeping hold of the dagger is the more aggressive play. Yeah. <laughs> because it allows you to do a swing and then a blade flurry when you play the second Tinker. So actually not going face with that is the more aggressive play in the next couple of turns. It's very true, actually. And There's a poison as well. Drake comes down, does pick up the poison. So he's uh, starting to build up a ton of damage in his hand, but a sap is used. There is a Belcher in hand. His opponent's at 30. He is a very, very long way away right now from being able to put together the lethal damage, and he does have to give up one charge of his dagger here to deal with that marker. Which, in in many senses, halves the, the largest part of the damage he was going to be able to do. Yeah. Uh, the war leader, sorry, not Murkai. I was looking at Murkai. <laughs> so many Murlocs. Can't tell yeah. them apart. So many Aces. Murlocs, so little time. Um, this Murloc racism you've got going on there, Sotil. Can't tell is. the Murlocs apart. <laughs> oh, wow. Shots fired. Um... So the situation we have now is, as we talked about before, the War Leader helps turn um, Blue Girl Warrior into a really effective removal spell. He gets to play Murkai as well. Murkai will get stuck in for six to face, and then the Blue Girl will trade to the Drake. And yeah, we are just uh, threatening to, to seal this game just with uh, Murloc synergy here, pretty much. Not even really going to need the anything unless there's some sort of dramatic answer to this board. But that Abyss pickup is uh, pretty solid. Well, for risk of outing myself as a as even more of a noob than i already have you know we've all been there and i know i know in fact you've been there yourself this season that you uh you're a little bit too low on the ladder for comfort towards the end of the season and some prick plays warlock warlock murlocs into you and uh you end up losing in the saddest Wait, what? possible that has not happened to me i have no really idea happens are in rank 10 about <laughs> the 25th of the month stop being rank 10 then like, what the i mean i would i'm just not good enough that's the problem <laughs> like way to expose yourself on stream callum hey you were like rank nine <laughs> what you were like rank nine this season like three weeks in because i'm playing on all three servers and i've been traveling around the world callum still doesn't get <laughs> It's the same thing. Um, it feels bad, man. It's fine. That's why you're here to be the intelligent one. You're the, you're the one of the most intelligent casters in the scene, which is good because you have to be intelligent for the both of us. Fair enough. Anyway, our little distraction as we briefly fought like an old married couple has led to a Drake being on the board and the Murlocs being cleared out. Um, so a Murkai, two War Leaders and a Bluegill, I believe, have gone in the Anything Bank. So that is already a great deal of damage. Well, <laughs> I still have the idea of an Anything Bank. <laughs> the Anything like it's Like it's a game show, you know, you've got that, that's safe. <laughs> uh, so the War Leader is going to come down here. That is War Leader number two on the board. Um, so we are in pretty good shape for an anything at any point when it is drawn. But the Rogue has stacked up on cards here, has a lot more proactive resources on the board, has the Lotheb to lock out that anything for at least one turn, but 
staring at 13 health right now, has to be able to react to even every small board that the Paladin makes, or just be threatening to take way too much damage. Yeah, and he, you know, Blade Flurry even here, you're going to kill off the War Leader and make the, uh, the anything that could come off the, do the top of the deck at any time very much lethal. Yep. 10, 10 health is not a lot of damage against this deck as well. It's not. Uh, the Anything is lethal at this point, single-handedly, so to play around that, Orange feels like Lothab needs to be needs to be generated this turn. Uh, but he's just in bad shape. We don't see the Anything in Strife Crow's hand yet, but there's two copies of it in the deck, and a lot of the cards that aren't Anything at this point are just card draw, so... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you lose a series, if you just get, like, swept by Murloc Paladin, is, how bad is that in terms of ways to lose a series? It's bad because you know you could have just brought a deck that it can't beat. Um, I mean, I guess Orange did, right? Did Orange bring Druid and get it banned? Is that what? No, Orange just didn't bring Druid. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's and... one of the best natural counters for this deck. Druid and Face Shaman are two of the most effective things you can do to beat, uh, beat this deck. Unless, um, you know, Face Shaman just happens way too quickly for this deck to keep up with, unless they draw all the early game stuff, Pyro quality early on. So, the way this deck works at the moment, because it's not particularly well refined, is that the matchups are really polarized. It, it beats the decks that it's aimed at, but it hasn't quite found that solid basis so that it has a chance in the matchups that it's not aimed at. Um, so, things like Midrange Druid and Aggro decks in general can, can really dig away at it, but. Uh, Orange's lineup is a little bit exposed to this deck, so Strike Crow is being rewarded for his uh, bravery of bringing the, the Anything Pally here. One of the real problems we're seeing here that Orange is having with the deck is the uh, the impact of that humility in the Aldor Peacekeeper, because it's removed eight power from those two bit, relatively big sized minions on the board, which you know would be repetitive damage. And there's a second Lay on Hands as well, so this Lay on Hands could come down and get Strife Crow all the way back up to 30. Yeah, I think we're going to see Pyro Consecration this turn. It activates the Solemn Vigil, which will go ahead and kill his Pyromancer, but this this serves the same purpose, right? It gets him pretty much just as close to his Anything, but it also has the added bonus Ooh. of clearing his opponent's board. Second Solemn Vigil comes out, and there is the Anything, so that Anything should pretty much be GG at this point. I believe Double War Leader, one Blue Gill, and Murkai is where we're at right now, which is yeah. plenty of damage. Yes. I, yeah, it's more more than enough. Yeah, we don't we don't even need to count, even though we're not that great at counting today. Yeah, Farsi are gonna come down more than likely, but probably not good enough. He might even play the Edwin here just to have the extra tempo. He knows that the Farsi won't be enough to ensure him against the anything here anyway. But it's like he is just gonna develop it, and that is gonna be game three. So that's uh, just quickly, it's 15 damage, yeah. five overkill. Okay. Well, Strife Girl, two game wins with the Murloc Paladin, and that's going to leave Orange with the Warrior. It's not a good matchup. It's not. It's it's awkward either way. Obviously, if you're playing Patron Warrior, they have the um, double equality clears, double equality with four activators total in the deck to deal with it. So plus Consecrate Pyromancer. Plus Pyromancer Consecrate as well. So yeah, just another combination of those same cards that can work. So you're very unlikely to be able to get a, a Patron board to stick. Um, and it's kind of hard to tempo them for the same reasons, which is often you're out in matchups where that doesn't work. They can still use those cards to clear effectively in that situation. Plus, they have True Silvers, which actually interact pretty well, and plus all the Aldor and uh, Humility nonsense. Um, so it's hard to get a foothold in that match as a Patron Warrior. As a Control Warrior, your only out most of the time is to try and just out-armor the anything, but the level that you need to get to to make that happen is just ludicrously high. Yeah, I mean, you're talking at least 15 to 20 armor at the end of the game when the any fins are coming down. Oh, do triple that. Like, yeah. it's it's insane. You need so much goddamn life. Like, <laughs> 50 life is not going to cut it. We're talking like 70 to 80 is what you're going to need. Like, it's an insane amount of damage that can be output on the second on the second anything. Yeah, that I, that's what makes the combo so frustrating to play against, I think, is that even if they haven't been able to line up the first one, once they've played the first one, they have everything they need for the yeah. second one. Yeah, as long as, like, two or three Murlocs, and then as long as, if you get double anything in your hand and you have enough time to cast them both, you win most matchups on the spot. Um, 
which is why it is a frustrating deck. It's a deck that gets a lot of hate from people. Um, it's a it's a deck that follows the same kind of uninteractive strategy that Warsong Patron did and that people really hated on. But at the same time, like we need this kind of variation. We need to find some way for this kind of deck to be allowed to be inserted into the game, but at a power level where it's competitive against everything else, but it doesn't dominate everything else. That kind of thing is healthy for the balance of the game. Um, but we're still, you know, Hearthstone's still a relatively new game. We're still struggling to, to find that kind of foothold. Combo decks have definitely been a problem as time has gone on. Um, and one of the main things that Blizzard has looked at. But anything is kind of the new kid on the block. So. Yeah, for now. Uh, it's not as insidious as uh, Patreon Warrior was yet. Otherwise, everyone would be playing it. Yeah. As, as such, we've only seen one person play it out of ten players so far. We'll right. see if we maybe get to see some more later on. But... Uh, yeah, this is it. This is interesting for Strife Crow's opponents because obviously these lineups are locked in, and if you've, uh, if you maybe have three decks which are bad and one that is good, then you can be pretty sure what Strife Crow is going to ban, and it can be a, a frustrating experience for a potential future opponent if he's able to seal out this series. But yeah, it looks like Patron for Orange here. Full gold Patron as well. It does. So I'm just seeing in chat right now just one message that caught my eye. Apparently Dog has won as a warrior versus anything with about 70 HP total. Okay. So that looks to be That's about the benchmark. number that you're going for, yeah. Um, but this is the patron warrior, so that is not going to be the game plan in this matchup. And honestly, this hand that we're looking at right here from Orange looks to be pretty solid. This is what you need to do. You need to tempo out early with your minions. Try and force clears on boards that are not Grim Patrons and then generate the Grim Patrons afterwards. That's going to be one of your few hopes of winning the game that isn't just go all in on Patrons as soon as possible and hope they don't have it. Yeah, and looks like he's looking at the coin frothing Berserker here on turn, on turn three. I mean, we did talk about the difficulty in getting a foothold with this deck, and an early frothing Berserker is the sort of thing which might help you get that early foothold, but there is an equality in the hand already. In fact, there's an equality Pyromancer. Yeah. Now. Um, so, no great need to react to this right now. He may or may not choose to play the Acolyte. He certainly won't hero power, but, um, you know, this, this Frothing Berserker doesn't have to be too uh, fearful. He doesn't have to be too fearful of this Frothing Berserker this turn. He can just happily chop it down with the True Silver on the following turn. And a Fiery Warwick's can chop down the Acolyte. So, these early minions get the answer pretty well by the weapon. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, hard to say who's come out ahead on this initial exchange. Obviously, Strife Crow cycles a card with his Acolyte, but Orange does get to dig in that three damage to face from the Frothing. But True Silver going to come down here, and although we talked about how True Silver is a little bit too honest these days to be able to beat most minions, Frothing Berserker is a nice interaction for it, for sure. Yeah, it's it's not a bad one. It's a pretty good minion for it to be able to kill, but there's a Shredder, and there is a Sludge Belcher for five as well. Uh, feeling very paladin here all of a sudden. Pilot Shredder, Sludge Belcher. <laughs> no mysterious challenger, but there's a doctor there, so. Yeah, but Sludge Belcher from Strike Crow's side of his own means that he can take control of this board relatively effectively as long as there isn't nonsense. Oh, an armor spin. Hey. That's a good that's a pretty good get from the Shredder, right? Because as we were discussing, you need to get a ton of armor in this matchup. Might yeah. As well, but... Might as well get started. Potentially, also, just the fact it's one of very few um, four health and above minions that you could have got um, from the Pilot Shredder, which is pretty important right now because you have those two Battle Rages in your hand that you really want to use. So being able to nudge that Armor Smith into the Belcher at some point and start cycling those Battle Rages could be really important. Well, there is a Consecrate, there's a Quality, there's a uh, Quality Wild Paramancer. What can be done to clear this board here? Uh, I mean, I think it's it's chill time. I think you need to just wait. Um, probably just develop the second true silver. Um, it can clear out the first half of the Belcher, but you're you're pretty much just based on this hand, waiting for the time to get value out of your equality clear at this point. Because you have equality and three separate activators for it in your hand. It's basically the makeup of your entire options right now. So you need to find some way to get a little bit greedy, get your opponent to overcommit, get a nice clear on the board with with an equality combo. Well, we'll see if Orange takes that bait. And he's also looking for something to do this turn, Orange, when it comes his way. He doesn't have anything really worth playing here. He can't get a great Battle Rage even. He could get two cards, but that's about it. There is a Slam picked up, so that's, that's going to help him clear up this board at least. 
chat has now caught up to the rank nine discussion. Just, just so you cool. Know. Yeah. Are they? Are they? Are they enjoying it? They're they're suitably impressed. Yeah. I know. I I, I live to exi to amuse Twitch chat. Yeah. So yeah, as we mentioned, I'm actually I'm actually a gimmick. I'm I'm one of the best players in the world. I'm high legend every <laughs> season. It's all a gimmick. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Uh, you know that Fibonacci guy? It's actually me. That's me. Ah, yeah. I did wonder. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't look much like you when he appeared on stream the other day. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's a Masan thing. You just like have someone else play. For you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we we may have we may have gone in too deep, Callum. Oh, he gets a wolf to play for him. I saw it. A wolf. We did the, we did the tournament. Wolf. He gets the wolf to play for him. Yeah, all right. That's what I meant. Of course, that's what I meant. <laughs> Ah, oh, anyway, so the high health of the Armorsmith does come in useful. It did end up only trading into the slime, so most drops off the Shredder would have done the same thing, but being able to cycle both of the Battle Rages, uh, fill up his hand immediately there with a with a huge amount of options is very, very beneficial. He is still missing those Patron pieces, but Orange's aim here will probably be to see an equality clear from his opponent uh, before he commits any Patrons to the board. So honestly, this board of, you know, Dr. Boom plus things is, is perfectly acceptable in this situation. Yeah, I mean, as you say, he's just taking his time here. Hasn't necessarily had many Murlocs come out this game so far. Has double anything. Just needs to... I don't think we've seen a single Murloc this game. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think we saw... I don't think we have, no. Yeah. So the, the Murloc bank is still empty right now, Callum. It's a little bit, it's running, at, running low, you might say. The double anything is uh, ready to make a withdrawal from the Murloc bank <laughs> <laughs> when necessary. Oh, also, like Neville's, Neville's in chat is telling me he feels like uh, Murlocs is 50-50 against Druid, which I find really interesting. That's not been my experience with the deck. Um, I do play a, a slightly different list than, than Neville's does, so it might be a, a difference in, in tech cards and stuff, but that's really interesting information. Yeah, Nevs, I say it was, you know, I was talking to Nevs about the deck uh, earlier this week, and he is someone who's played a lot of Marlock Paladin. I would say that there are very few people who have played the deck more than he has, so I would value his his input. As you say, different versions of the list. There are there are some versions of the list which do have, uh, shall I say, maybe perhaps a little bit more to do in them yeah. in the the mid game. You know, they do play things like Shredders and. Stuff that you can actually play while waiting around for the combo to go off. Yeah. The Stop Armor Smiths are really. They are. They're really doing some work. They're getting there. War Leader comes down as the first Murloc of the game now, but having said that the, the goal of this deck would not be to gain a bunch of armor, he's successfully gaining a bunch of armor, and he can triple Armor Smith this turn if he wants to. I just want to see it. I've never seen triple Armor Smith Whirlwind happen before. I would quite like to see it happen. Just to see if the game can cope with it. Yeah, it's like uh, I I do always enjoy particularly when people like uh, disguise toast try and do oh this is a really weird interaction I wonder if this will work oh it turns out breaks the game <laughs> like the uh, the unearthed raptor thing right he's the first yeah. person to try that raptors copying raptors with facelesses and more raptors and yeah turns out the game just gives up yeah after a while um I, I just i i'm not even going to try and analyze what the best play is this turn i just want to see triple armor smith happen callum i just i want it so bad uh, i don't think you're going to get your wish unfortunately no 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 fair i like the inner rage on the humility to dr brim though yeah he's letting that war leader live which i mean that's does seem like the smart move yeah, and he's he's putting himself okay. in a it's really, kill it, really, really strong position here. Uh, the equality consecrate clear is pretty much going to have to come down here, I believe. He's just under too much threat of dying, and if equality consecrate comes down, then healing is cannot be cast. So the only out here would be pyro equality into heal bot. Um, if equality consecrate comes down, then he is just dead to the death spike gromash play. So this is really, really strong line from Orange here. And yeah, I can forgive him from skipping on the triple armor smith turn for sure, because him actually looking for the best play as opposed to just wanting memes with three armor smiths has found an extremely strong line here, which puts his opponent on a on a really really small uh, margin to get out of this. He's gonna go for the lay on hands instead. I'm waiting on this board. Wow, he's already facing down 11, 15, 19 damage. Is this? Is this lethal with Gromash? Uh, yes. 
Yes, it is. Five, yeah, nine plus ten from Gromash. Well, Orange. Probably very, very fearful of this deck, but like I said, he got the kind of draw he wanted, which wasn't just all the patrons and combo pieces. He got the tempo side of his deck. He got all the early game minions, was able to build a ball presence. Um, that Armorsmith that came out of the Shredder still lived to see the end of the game, just sacrificed itself to the, the death bite there at the end. Um, so yeah, that early tempo draw that he got there, clearly what you need to be able to have a chance in that matchup. Well, you know what we have here? So, we have another five-game series. Yeah. It's almost like these people don't want us to sleep tonight. Mm, apparently not. So what do we got here? We got the war, the Warrior and the Warlock, right? For Strife Girl. Uh, so Patron Warrior from Orange, and yeah, it looks like the Warlock is remaining from Strife Girl. Well, let's uh, let's see what version of Warlock Strife Girl is bringing. He's an unconventional Paladin choice, certainly with the, the Marlock Paladin, but it, it did get the job done. Got him two wins here and came very close to to three one i think it was definitely a possibility that orange was gonna come out come out on the wrong side of that and it, you know do you what do you think about that last decision from strife Girl to to pass the turn effectively and do the lay on hands and uh and not play around a potential gromash um i mean it was the same thing he didn't like the equality consecrate player didn't play around gromash either because he was at 14 health so like he could have swung to face with the death spite to get out of range but Honestly, like how long, how 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 like how good is that at keeping you in the game? Like you're playing around Gromash, but you're not playing around Gromash in a rage, for example. So like, sure, the play would have been desperate, you'd, but you'd have been a quality consecrating a board that didn't even have patrons on it. And then on top of that, you'd be still just two damage away from a regular Gromash lethal, potentially lethal within a rage anyway. Like, I don't know. I feel like Leon Hands may have been the the play to win there from Strife Crow. I don't blame him too much for doing it. All right, well, we do see something a little bit more conventional that we've seen so far today from Strife Crow. It looks to be a very similar list to Sixo's Zoo list we saw earlier with the Argent Squires and the Sea Giants. Yep. Um, so, Patron, pretty comfortable against most builds of Zoo. The Sea Giants coming out early can uh, put a crimp on things if there's no execute in hand, but... Generally, your tools like Unstable Ghoul, the weapons, slams, etc., do pretty well at dealing with, with early Zoo boards, and Zoo is one of those decks that has a horrible time dealing with, with any board of patrons getting generated. So this is a matchup that you usually feel confident in as the Patron Warrior, but um, we'll see how this develops. Stroko taking some time with his early turns here. Is there a, uh, is there a consideration of coining out a two-drop there, or do you just go with the Argent Squire? Uh, I think the Argent Squire is fine. Just keep the, the coin for flexibility afterwards. You know, coining out the Creeper doesn't really put any additional power on board over the Argent Squire, and you're not really going to go for the YOLO coin juggler play against a warrior with the threat of Fiery War Axe, so um, just staying on curve with the one drop seems reasonable. Yeah, I was, uh, that's uh, definitely what I was thinking. I was just wondering why Strife Crow was, uh, was maybe th taking a little bit long over that. Strife Crow is a very thoughtful player. Comes from the uh, the life coach school of temp of tempo hmm. he likes to think through all his available options i think yeah and this is just unstable ghoul doing unstable ghoul things here it's just one of the most irritating minions in the game for these these early board development decks zoo and uh, secret paladin particularly because generally you have to play some sort of buff or source of extra damage to get through it when it's played on turn two so you think about secret paladin they play shielded mini bot you play unstable ghoul their best answer to that, in theory, is muster, but obviously that is just a horrible play for them. Same situation there with Strife Crow. He had one power on the board, the Unstable Ghoul came down. The ideal answer to a 1-3 in that situation is Abusive Sergeant, but again, that's just a horrible play. So Unstable Ghoul can just be a nightmare for these decks to deal with early on. And uh, Strife Crow misses one important knife here on the Frothing, but he has two more chances, picks it up on the first attempt. Good. So that could have been... That could have been bad, but... I... It, was, it worked out okay for, for Strife Crow here. He's getting a decent board to start with. That is is what he needs to do. You know, you did talk about the Sea Giant being really crucial. If he can get that out early, mm -hmm. that's really going to make a difference. And, you know, as we hit turn five with the Belcher and the Lothab there for Orange, he's going to start being able to establish a board here that's very hard for the Zuka to deal with. Yeah, so he has to consider how he wants to react to this death bite, and yeah, tap into Haunted Creeper is probably the best option. The death or the death rattle ordering means that your your spiders won't die here if he chooses to attack into them. 
But playing the Dark Peddler just kind of gave a free target for that Death Spite to hit if Orange wanted to. Um, sure, right now he can go face if he wants to or hit the Creeper, but putting that clean 2-2 on the board just didn't seem like a wise idea at the time. Yeah, he, he wants to try and establish the board here. That, that's the whole point of Zoo, right? Is You want to make things stick on the board and anything which is going to get removed straight away and leave you with a clear board is not not great zooing. Right. Zookeeping. Zookeeping. Um, so yeah, he is going to go ahead and trade into the Creeper here. Probably just develop Sludge Belcher. He saw one Power Overwhelming get used already, so probably isn't too scared of these 1-1s trading into his Sludge Belcher too effectively. And uh, Strife Crow sat with the double Sea Giant in hand, but he's at least drawing decent stuff off the top here, and hopefully from his perspective, this Peddler can give him a Power Overwhelming number two. Let's see. Uh, looks like he's taking his time here, so unless it's a, a bluff, then I would suspect the Power Overwhelming isn't there. Not really much merit in bluffing the Power Overwhelming anyway, because you'll probably play it immediately if you draw it. So it's probably an awkward decision between three of those mediocre one drops that you often see in this situation, and so which means we'll probably see the Imp Gang boss get developed this turn instead of whatever he picks. I think I might have just turned face in Twitch chat. They caught up to the uh, Mr. Destructoid spam. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Imp Gang boss is developed. He did get Flame Imp, which is pretty solid. So. Can't be too sad about it, but he would have loved a, a power overwhelming there. Even though it would have prevented the Imp Gang boss play, he probably still would have played it along with the tap. Um, but the board is starting to fill up now to the point where those Sea Giants can sneak their way into play. And no execute as of yet in Orange's hand, but he does have Death's Bite number two, which interacts pretty damn well with this board right now. Yeah, Death's Bite can clear up this Imp Gang boss, which is nice for Orange again. Anytime we can clear whatever the zoo is putting down, uh, he's getting. You know, a little bit low on health, does need to play, maybe look at this armor as, well, as he plays it to uh, try and stabilize his life total a little bit. But these, as you say, these sea, gi sea giants could come down here, and that is going to be a threat. But with the sludge belcher in play, it's going to, he's going to be able to stall it for a little while. He is, yeah. Uh, so he can Iron Beak Owl, Flame Imp, Sea Giant this turn. He would Owl, the Sea Giant would go down to 4 mana, he'd play Flame Imp, the Sea Giant would go down to 3 mana. Um, so he can play like, that play if he wants to, but Owling the Belcher here really doesn't give him that much value. It's not as if it like lets him trade into the Armorsmith or anything. So he's going to consider whether or not exactly he wants to commit that Owl right now. Hmm, as he says. What do you think? Should he play the owl? It's... The sea giant. Well, it's... He can play, yeah, he can play both, so... Yeah, 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 he can play both, but he's... I guess he's scared of an execute. It's just gonna owl the armor smith instead, just to remove some of the armor. Um, but the execute here would be pretty devastating, because he can just attack cleanly into the flame imp, and then his whole board goes bye-bye here, so... Um, I guess I like the play to out the Armorsmith, just reduce, reduce some of the armor, and that Battle Rage could be a huge pickup here. He gets to make four draws off it and hit into the 3-2, so he has four chances to hit two executes. Those sound like pretty good odds, depending on, again, if you're uh, playing with subtle RNG or regular RNG. It's very true. So Battle Rage is going to come out here, four draws, Really important that he does hit and execute here. He does have that tiny taunt in the way of the 8-7 Sea Giant oh, here, here right? And he does pick it up, slams it onto the board. Yeah, as you say, very crucial. And that Frothing Berserker as well, big threat. And picking up the, the Dr. Boom is pretty good as well. He can really dominate the board from this point. Yep. And this is kind of the issue that this, this new Zoo deck runs into. Like... Previously, the philosophy of Zoo was that every card you draw was good on the turn that you drew it. So you could life tap and you'd always get something effective on every turn. When you start filling your deck up with uh, you know, Gormok, Sea Giant, some people are even playing like Enhanced Omakano I've seen on more than one occasion recently. Which you hate, you told me earlier. Yeah, I absolutely hate that card. Um, <laughs> When you, when you put all those cards into Zoo, you get in this situation where your top decks are just less good individually and you're relying too much on being right. ahead of the board. Um, so yeah, it kind of gets away from like the old school philosophy of Zoo here. Um, but I believe we have potential lethal here. 
There are... One, two, three, four, five, six minions on the board. This buffs it to 10. The Armorsmith will trade and buff it to 12. The Inner Rage will buff it to 14. And the Whirlwind hits five minions. 19. Uh, interesting. So the Armorsmith trades here and then buffs. Uh, I think we're one short, maybe? Wait, patron math I leave to you. Too short. Too short. Okay. But I don't think it's going to matter. I think Strife Girl is going to go ahead and concede, realizing he is uh, probably lost from this point. Hmm. Another win for Archon here this evening. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just in case in chat you're saying he was too off. Um, he was too off, but he used it in a rage on a thing that couldn't attack. That would have given him two extra damage on the Frothing Berserker, but it would have meant one less minion on the board when he whirlwinded, so he still would have been one off. Well, there you go. Orange is going to advance tomorrow, and he is going to play Ryzen in the round of eight. That'll be the second match that we see tomorrow. Uh, a good performance from Orange there, and you know, coming back against that that Murloc Paladin, which necessarily he he was a little bit unfavoured against, so was in a, a bad spot in the matchup, but was able to to bring it back and win three to two. Yeah, very much so. It looked like he was in trouble there with uh, not really having a solid counter to the Anything Paladin in his lineup, but he was able to dig it out with the Patron Warrior with a really solid tempo draw, um, followed that up by uh, winning a favorable matchup with the Patron Warrior against Zoo. But um, everything came and, and hinged on that Patron Warrior versus Anything game that he was uh, probably very, very thankful to come out with a win with. Absolutely. Well, we're going to come back with our next game in just a few minutes. It's going to be Hoy versus Jab. As I say, the, the great matches keep on coming all night long here in the Wombology tournament. You're watching the tournament here on Twitch, of course, brought to you by Womble.gg, where you can play cash matches and get your friends and popular streamers in all the esports games. And of course, by Screenshoe as well. We will see you in just a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Wombology on Twitch. <laughs> 